All right. Well, last uh, uh, last week on Loving the Scriptures, we started to look at First uh, Peter chapter three. We only looked at the first couple of verses of that chapter. We just kind of started to dip our way to this discussion um, of submission in the home, and specifically, what we looked at last time was um, the wife submitting to the husband, even in um, in uh, in a in a marriage relationship that is unequally yoked. So the woman is a Christian and the husband is not. And Peter is going to dive in a little bit more and talk about what what all of that involves and why it's important. And I think that as we continue to look at the, at the uh, next handful of verses, we're going to see some very interesting things. The things that the wife are told to do isn't, doesn't start as it's, you know, as its primary motivation as, you know, doing this for the sake of the husband, although that is, you could say that's somewhat of a secondary issue. But what we're going to see is that all of this uh, comes from um, a situation where the woman uh, puts her primary hope, trust and focus on God. And from there, proceeding from that, hopefully we should see we would see God at work and how that affects the husband and how it affects the wife um, uh, as far as her role in submitting to the husband um, who is a non-believer. So um, I hope to uh, uh, unpack all of that um, uh, in this episode. I think we're in some, we're some very good things. So I hope you stay with us. My name is Steve Gill and you're listening to Loving the Scriptures. All right, so I'm looking forward to diving right in here um, into our passage of um, of First Peter chapter three. Um, I, uh, you know, like I mentioned before, we started this discussion last time. We looked at the first couple of verses, and we kind of we kind of did a, a little bit of a um, an overview of the whole concept of submission. Uh, in the home, um, and particular, and particularly as it relates to the wife, wife, uh, the wives submitting or being subject to, uh, subject to the husbands. And remember that in this portion of First Peter, this is all within a, a broader context um, of what it looks like to uh, to live in um, in the midst of unbelievers. And so that's why, you know, this that's why this is being fleshed out here um, as it relates to a wife in the home. Um, who is uh, who is living with a husband who is an unbeliever? Now remember what we what what I said before is that what we're dealing with in that is not people coming into a marriage where they're unequally yoked. Uh, what you're dealing with are two two people who got married as unbelievers and then one of them became a uh, one of them became a believer. That's what we're dealing with here. And so how do you how does how does a, how does a wife how does a woman deal with something like that? And so. I'm going to remind you again of the wider context here. The wider context of what we're dealing with goes all the way back to uh, chapter two and in verse 12. And so remember what it says. I'm going to read it again. I've read it over the past several weeks, but it's good again just to bring it back up so we can so we can have a fuller understanding of what we're dealing with here. So he says there in chapter in chapter two, verse 11, he says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. So that when you when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. And the whole thing of honorable living, Peter starts to break this down in a few categories uh, to kind of give illustrations as to what this looks like living honorably among among the, among the pagans. So that even when they do say bad things about you, even when they do say evil things about you, you have a life record if you want to call it that, before their eyes that would demonstrate to the contrary what other people of the world are saying and the fact that they are evildoers. So it's very hard for people to label you as an evildoer if you subject yourself to the authority of the government, right? That's the one example. Um, and then it's it's hard for people to label you as an evildoer if they see that you are subject to uh, your employer, Right. And not being rebellious, and even even when even when you are undergoing hard times underneath the employer or uh, people in government because of your faith in Christ, okay, um, you know that doesn't change anything. The subjection matter um, is is you know the, the time that you go against that is when is when they give you, when they tell you specific things to do that violates uh, scriptural mandate. Right. And that's and, you know, we've talked about that um, on uh, several different points, it seems like already. So we don't need to 
to go over it again. But I bring all of that up again, just to remind you that what we're dealing with here with the wife, uh, with the wife submitting to the husband and the husband being one who is an unbeliever, as, as it says there, the way it's worded there in chapter three is that if they do not obey the word, which is another way of saying that they don't, they don't live according to scripture because they are not a believer in Christ, therefore an unequally yoked. What we're dealing with here is another, is another category in which, um, a person's lived testimony, um, is important in the eyes of the world and in the eyes of somebody in the home who is not a believer. I think one of the things that I mentioned last time is that it's interesting that in these categories and these situations, uh, these examples that Peter is using here, it, it kind of goes from a broad spectrum just as it relates to how we how we relate to certain people within those categories. And it narrows down into to the most intimate of, of settings, and that is a marriage relationship in the home. OK, so you have the broadest of those examples being a Christian's relationship to the government. And then it's narrowed down to this whole thing of, of what this looks like in, in the home. And specifically as it relates to a wife, uh, uh, who is living with a, with a, uh, with a husband, uh, who is not a believer. Now you remember what we talked about last time. We don't have to go too much in detail about this, but except, but just to mention, uh, just in brief passing as just as a review is that in the first century world, this would have been a big deal because for the woman to, uh, make this decision to, to follow Christ, to submit herself to Christ outside of the permission of her husband would have been a big deal. Um, in the 21st century American mind, it, I mean, you know, I, I think a conversion still might cause a little bit of problems depending on who you're talking about, but, um, really it's not, it's not going to be looked upon in the same way in our world, in our time today, as it was in the first century back at that time in the Greco Roman world for a woman to just simply do that uh, independent of her husband was a big deal. Um, and you know, it could could be the, the the perfect starting point of problem starting um, within within that within, within that sphere within within the sphere of the home, okay. And so right now it seems like you're already you're already asking for trouble. But even from the woman's standpoint and from the woman's perspective, remember we talked about the whole thing from her from her vantage point. She sees herself now in a relationship with a man where she herself would be able to see herself on a different level as her husband because she's seeing things through the perspective of truth, whereas her husband is not operating on that line of truth that's revealed in Scripture that's available through Jesus Christ. So her temptation might be, well, I don't have to submit to him anymore. I submit to Jesus Christ. I mean, it's kind of the same temptation, the same line that somebody else would use um, as it relates to a, an unbelieving uh, employer or people in government. But here what we're dealing with and what Peter what Peter lays out for for the for the woman in this situation is to be submissive to the husband so that and I'm going to read here. um, uh, in the middle of verse one and into verse two, it says, so that even if, even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. So the, so the way the wife lives before the husband is the name of the game. It's not to say that it's wrong to, to bring up scriptural things to the husband if the door is open to do that. But what Peter is saying there for the wife is that she, uh, that she does not need to, to, uh, to hound and harass, uh, the, the husband if the husband is not having it and is not interested in, in, in receiving Christ or repenting and, and turning his life over to Christ in true repentance and faith. Um, her job is not to, is not to beat his head, uh, beat him over the head with the Bible. Um, you know, we talked about a little bit about some of the things of how, how that might look, you know, in the, in that particular situation. But even in that situation, conduct works the way that the woman walks in the home speaks a very powerful word, um, within the home, w within that home environment. Now, that doesn't mean that, that, uh, that in those situations, all, uh, all husbands will eventually, um, come to their senses and then because of the conduct of their wives, turn their lives over to Christ. Unfortunately, you'll have some situations where that husband just won't budge. And even in some cases, the husband can't stand what has happened, the change that has happened with his wife, and he will leave and will divorce her. 
And as we know, and as we've talked about from places like First Corinthians chapter seven, we see that 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 if that happens and he wants to divorce, he wants to leave. Scripture says, let it happen. And that's one of one of, of two or three areas in Scripture where there's an exception um, that's laid out for divorce. You know, where divorce is okay. Okay, so um, so but other than that, I mean, if the if the husband is willing to stay. You know, you know, the the wife is to continue to live with the with the husband and be subject to him, um, so that he can have the opportunity to see the conduct of her life. Um, and I think that that's a um, that's a that's a very uh, um, that's a very important thing. Which, by the way, it kind of it kind of sheds some light on on the whole issue of divorce and the prohibition of divorce when you're when you're dealing with 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 two believers in the home with a uh with a with a Christian woman and a Christian man you know I've heard from some people who would say that if the man is not is not um is not uh, uh carrying out his divine leadership role in a biblical way uh, the way that he's been biblically biblically called to do if he's slack in that or if he's not doing his job as a leader of the home then divorce is justified um no, uh, I would love to see chapter and verse in scripture that would say that it's okay for a woman to divorce the husband when that's the case. But even with what you're looking at here, you can see that 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 sort of notion is shut down. If the Bible is telling a woman to stay in the marriage and to submit herself to her husband, who is an unbeliever, who by default, if he's an unbeliever, doesn't have the divine biblical leadership motivation behind the things that he does. And in fact, even in the first century sense, that would have, uh, he would have been miles apart probably from, from what that would look like. If that's the case here, then how can we, how can people justify saying that within the Christian marriage, if the husband's not doing his job, then then it's okay for the wife to divorce. Um, that sort of thing just doesn't add up. If we're seeing it here, um, with the woman who is in an unequally yoke relationship, um, then, um, I would say that divorce is, uh, is prohibited, uh, even when you're talking about an equally yoked relationship between a Christian man and a Christian woman, um, within the home. Okay. We're dealing. So just to lay that out in case that was on anybody's mind, but, um, uh, but anyway, I don't want to digress too much into, into that. That's also, that's a totally different, uh, different subject, but those are those are kind of the things that we that we talked about and we kind of eased our way into um, in talking about this topic this topic of wives being subject to their husbands. Now remember, just as a reminder, and again, there's part of me that feels like I don't have to repeat this, but I I, I probably should. Submission does not involve women submitting themselves to husbands in demeaning, demoralizing ways. I gave you an example of what that might look like uh, last time. Um, uh, you know, nor does it does it. Uh, well, actually, I don't think I mentioned this last time, but I should. Is that I don't think that that submission. Well, I, it's not that I don't think. I know it doesn't mean that that women are to be submissive and to stay under the headship of a man who is physically uh, sexually, whatever, abusing her. We're not talking about something where, because submission is a thing in the Bible, that if the husband is smacking you around every which way that you just, that you, that you're staying under that roof because, Hey, got to be submissive. No, leave, leave, leave that house, go to somewhere that's safe. Um, I'm not one who would say necessarily go for a divorce at that, at that point, at that point, but at the very least you need to get out of that environment. Um, and, uh, because you're not, you're not a man's punching bag. Um, and you know, I don't, I don't care what you say. There's no, ex- there's no excuse for a man to be laying his hands on a woman like that, especially his wife. You know, I've talked to people who have been abused, have been in abusive relationships before. And it's interesting, you know, even, even when they're out of that relationship, um, and, uh, they don't have to deal with that person anymore. They still, they still try and, and, and justify what the man did by saying, well, I, you know, I, I, I did have a big mouth. I had, I had one, one woman told me that like, yeah, you know, he broke my jaw, but you know, I, I, I did, I, I did have a big mouth. And, and I said, I don't, I don't care if you had a mouth the size of Texas. That doesn't, that doesn't, that doesn't justify the man in beating the crap out of you. It it just it, it 
that's there's no excuse for that. So um, I want to make that that make that perfectly clear as well. But um, so just to you know, just to give you a little bit of an understanding of what we're what we are talking about and what we're not talking about. Um, as it relates to, to headship and submission. If you want to hear a little bit more about that, I went into some of that somewhat in the last episode, so just go back and, and review some of that. And I'm sure I'll bring it up again uh, here and there um, as our discussion goes along. Um, but um, let me do this. Let me let me read the entire section here, which is verses 1 through 7, even though, again, we're not going to finish that se- this section. Um, but I want to read it in its totality so we have a full... A uh, complete uh, picture of what we're dealing with here, and what Peter says in this section. Okay, so uh, in uh, in First Peter chapter three, starting in verse one, he says, "Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorn you do not let your adorning be external." the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Okay, so um, like I said, we we uh, last time we looked at the first couple of uh, uh, first couple of verses, uh, which uh, which talked about the woman uh, being subject to the husband um, and doing this for you know it, it's, it's hope that through that um, the the husband will be able to see the wife's pure and respectful conduct. Um, and that would serve as a testimony so that he can be one without, you know, without words, uh, but could be, but could be drawn to Christ by the behavior of his wife. Okay. Now we talk about, we talk about the behavior of the wife in the home as she's submitting herself to her unbelieving husband. Um, and I think what Peter is going to, what, what Peter is going to lay out here is that that outward living comes from comes from something that is that is that is done on the inside. Uh, you know, we talk about outward beauty versus inward beauty, and that's what that's what Peter is 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 sort of going to hit at. Is sort of going to hit at here is that the 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 source of this um, of this of this conduct that that you that you that we would see going on comes from the inside. And it expresses itself on the outside. That's where the beauty of of what's enacted on the outside comes from. It comes from the beauty that comes from within, which that's not something that the woman herself kind of manufactures on her own. That's something that's done with the work of God. That's where I that's that's where I think that Peter is 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 coming from here. And to and to introduce this point and to make this point, what he does is he does it. He makes a comparison between the outward adorning versus the inward adorning, right? In other words, what he's going what he's going to tell the woman, what he's going to tell the wife in this unequally yoked marriage relationship is saying don't put so much concentration on the outside, but your concern should be what's going on on your inside with the heart, okay? So let's look at how let's look at how he kind of unwraps this concept here, okay? By looking at verse 3. Okay? And in verse 3, this is what he says. He says, do, uh, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. OK, now let's stop right there. So that's that's what he's saying. Don't the don't do don't do that. Don't let don't let this the adorning be on the outside. OK, um, now, listen, let me tell you what he's not saying. What he's not saying is that neglect yourself neglect outward beauty and everything like that he's not saying that you're that you're that your hair should look like medusa that you should wear shabby rag raggedy clothing um and 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 just and just looking just not good all around as if you're that as if there's something wrong of taking care with taking care of yourself externally that's not what he's saying what he's saying is that you should not put preoccupation on the external now I know that in our day, um, there are many women 
and I think I'd be safe to say this and be correct. There are many women who put a lot of focus and a lot of concentration on what they look like on the outside. And they have to have the perfect hairdo. They have to have the perfect clothing, right? They have to have the right good looking jewelry on, you know, in order for them to feel like they're like they're beautiful all around. And so they spend a great deal of time concentrating on what they look like. Now, again, I'm not saying it's not it, it's a bad thing to to present yourself outwardly in a presentable manner and to and to dress yourself up on the outside. But again, there's something to be said about putting too much preoccupation on those things. OK, and in Peter's case here, what he's going to be saying is, is what he's going to be saying is, is that is that um, is that putting your concentration on that at the exclusion of the inside is not good. OK, now these things, you know, like I said, the beauty for a lot of women here in our culture, in our day to day is very important. It was really no different for, for women in the in the first century, in the first century world world as well. These things that are that are listed here, um, the braiding of the braiding of hair um, and the putting on of gold jewelry and um, or the clothing you wear. I mean, those are those are things that were very important. And some people went all out of their way to really deck themselves out so that they can so that they can look a certain way within uh, within society at large. Uh, you know, Paul kind of talks about this as it relates to believers in the church. Um, with women in the church, um, you know, in in uh, in First Timothy chapter two, you know, he's saying uh, he was saying that um, I think it's here. Let me look here in verse nine of chapter two he says likewise, also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel. So there he's not. So there again, you, you get this idea. He's not saying that it's uh, that it's bad to have good apparel. I mean, he says as long as it's respectable, right? Um, in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire. So it's, you know, it, almost the same language that Peter is using there in, in first Peter chapter three. And again, Paul's point was, is that you shouldn't put premium on those things as if that's the most important. And the thing is that at that time in Ephesus, because this is where this is where, you know, Paul's writing to Timothy, who's pastoring in Ephesus is that people were were dressing up in a way that drew attention to themselves and not to God and that and that was and that was the problematic thing that I think was was being dealt with there so not with any of those things but in verse 10 it says but with what is proper for women who pres, who profess godliness with good works so the good works that they do are supposed to be things that match their profession of godliness and that's what's supposed to be most important okay that's that's what that's what uh, that's what Paul lays out in uh, in first in first Timothy chapter two. So in the same way, you know, you, you kind of have the you have the kind of have the same thing going on as well here. You know, I, I was it was interesting because I was thinking over this passage and, you know, look, and as you know, as it's mentioned here about the whole thing of the braiding of the hair and the and the and the putting on of your bling and uh, and the. Uh, <laughs> It doesn't say bling, you know, uh, gold, uh, gold jewelry um, and the clothing that you wear. It kind of reminds me of different things, you know, like in, in Hollywood when you have the Oscars and stuff like that. Now, listen, you'll have segments on Inside Edition or, or, or Entertainment Tonight or whatever show that, the, that you know, you know, shows that you have, you know, when Oscar night is coming up or even after the night of Oscars and that, you know, they People talk about the, the dresses and the outfits and the hairstyles that the women are wearing and nothing to do with the guys. It, guys all look the same and dressed up in tuxedos and in and, and suits and, and things like that. But you have all sorts of different dresses and and glittering dresses and glittering jewelry and everything like that. And, you know, people talk about this stuff as if as if it's one of the biggest things about that night. Now, I don't care about the Oscars all around, so by by extension, I don't care about the red carpet and what people are wearing and, and what they showcase off of what they're wearing on their bodies. But at the same time, you know, I look at these things and I look at how people um, just kind of, you know, just kind of, they make this a big deal. I'm like, do people actually care about this stuff? D is this something that people pay, pay close attention to? Evidently, they do. It's a hot topic every every time it comes up, and I'm like, and I'm like, I couldn't care less. It, you know, it's just kind of one of those things. But 
even outside of outside of that context, Hollywood, the Oscars, Oscar night, you know, all those things, you know, for, for many people, the clothing that they wear, you know, it's, it's a super ultra important to them. And that's what they put most of their focus on. And even it, it, it and listen, I, I would, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that, you know, for, for, for some guys, that's, that's an obsession as well. But I think, I think women tip the scales on this one. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you'll disagree with me on that. But, but even if you look at this from through first century eyes, this was definitely the case um, for, for women in the first century in the Greco in the Greco Roman world. Okay. So this was definitely something where, where the outward was super duper important. Now, here's the thing. We also have to keep in mind of another possibility of what Peter might be saying here. This might this might be also addressing something where Peter is saying that wives, your outward appearance, don't use your outward appearance, i.e. the braided hair, the gold jewelry and the clothing that you wear and put so much attention on that in the hope that you will draw your husband to Christ. Maybe if I beautify myself a little bit more, he'll be more attached to me. And then, you know, he'll, I'll have an opportunity to, to talk to him about the appreciation I have for my God and everything like that. And so that, that'll earn him a, a, an ear. And so, you know, through that avenue, through putting all of my focus on the outside, it'll be a draw for my husband that will eventually down the road lead to him coming to Christ. That's another possibility of how we how we are to look at this and what Peter is trying to address to these Christian women who are who are married to uh, non-believing men, right? That's certainly a possibility. And so, in that case, what Peter would be saying is that your outward appearance is not going to be that factor that's going to that's going to draw your husband to Christ. In other words, it's not going to be what's on the outside; it's going to be what's on the inside. It's going to be the the person, the character, who you are, okay? And so that's what, and that's what he that's what he goes on to say. So if you go back to verse three again, the complete thing is: do not let your adorning be external, uh, the braiding of hair, and the putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear. Verse four: but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart. With the imperishable, with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is which in which in God's sight is very precious. Okay, so again, that's that's what that's what Peter is is, is getting at there. It's not a it's not a matter of, of what's on the outside, but it's it's what's on the inside. Or as Peter, but as Peter says, uh, the hidden person of the heart hidden in the sense that the source of this is coming from internal, you know, just from who you are on the inside. And I think we can make a, I think we, we wouldn't be too far off track in saying that the, the, the whole thing of Peter talking about the inside is talking about the inside that is, that is at work. That's, that's being, that's having work done on them by the Lord God himself in the sanctification process. Because anything apart from that really doesn't mean much, really doesn't mean anything. But if God is doing the work and God is doing the, is doing the progressive sancti- sanctifying and conforming you more and more into the likeness of Jesus Christ, that is really something that is going to count. Okay. And really what we, as we're relating this to the whole thing of a display before an unbelieving husband, what's the one thing that you would hope that the unbelieving husband sees within that home context? We would want them to see God at work in and through that believing wife, right? And that happens with, with what starts on the inside, the work that God does on the inside, okay? So... Having said that, let's let's step back a little bit here to the earlier words there in verse four and kind of notice something here because you notice remember in verse three what he what he's saying is that don't let your adorning be on, on all those things of the external. Now, if we're talking about the adorning of the external, those things on the outside, the braided hair, gold jewelry, fine clothing, whatever, we're talking about the adorning that that the woman does to herself, right? She's the one who who works on her hair. She's the one who puts on the jewelry on her body. She's the one who puts on the fine clothing and puts that on to wear to display towards other people. That is her adorning herself on the outside. 
But if we're talking about the, the comparison here in verse four, he's saying, we saying, but let your adorning be the hidden, uh, the hidden, uh, uh, the, the hidden uh, person of the heart. I think what we, what we would come to understand and what we would come to realize is, is that the effort of adorning, the main focus should be on the inside. So in other words, there are active steps that the woman is taking in order to beautify her inside, to beautify her spirit, okay, to beautify her character. All right. That's what we're dealing with. So I think I think in, in many ways what we're looking at here is, is a matter of effort. Don't spend so much time and effort on the outside, but you spend your effort on the outside doing. Doing things to beautify what really counts, where real beauty comes from, and that is from the inside, the hidden person of the heart, along with because notice that in verse four, it, it attached to that, he says the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. It's kind of talking about their their outward disposition. So that that gentle and quiet spirit, along with the the work and the beauty, beautifying that's done on the human heart on the inside, is a is a good combination for beauty to be expressed on the outward, just as it relates to the woman's conduct in the home and also her submitting herself to her submitting herself to her own husband. I think that's what that's uh, that's ultimately what we're what we're dealing with there. Okay. So it's it 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 ta- it, it brings up it, it talks about her uh um her disposition there which notice how how Peter describes it here with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. Now I think the way that we look at this is because again if we're doing a comparison between all those things that we're talking about outwardly all those things that we pay attention to outwardly down the road, as the years and the decades go by, that having to do with the outward, the beauty starts to fade. I mean, that's just the reality of life. Even with you, your own person, me, you, everybody else, the older that we get, there's going to be a time where we're, with, as we're advanced in years, if the Lord grants us uh, the grace of living, uh, a living a long life, there's a large part of our beauty our, our, our outward attractiveness that fades. Okay. You're, you know, once you, once you get, once you get up there in age, you're not going to look the same that you did when you were in your twenties and your thirties and even in your forties, you know, the, the outward beauty has faded. It's perished. It, it, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of gone by the wayside, even though we want to deny it. And even though there might be several things that we might want to do to kind of curb that, you know, anti-wrinkle cream and, and all that stuff, hair coloring, um, you know, all the things that we do. The fact of the matter is that, for, you know, from the natural point of view of what happens with our bodies and what happens to our looks, our beauty fades. We are not as beautiful in our later years than we are in our younger years. That's just the fact of life. But on the inside, and, and especially as it relates to the disposition that we have, you know, especially especially women, as it's talking about your, the the uh, the uh, beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, it says that is imperishable. That is imperishable beauty. That be that beautiful that beautiful and gentle spirit, gentle and quiet spirit, of a woman, is still sparkling bright with with beauty. Fifty years from now, just as it is now, or even as it was several years before now imperishable be- uh, beauty of those things that sort of beauty does not fade so if that's the case then where should we be putting our concentration on now again i'm not saying that uh, for the millionth time i'm not saying that it's wrong to, for for women to to want to look beautiful and to and to and to present themselves in a beautiful manner but it's a matter of emphasis what are we most concerned with and again if we're dealing with a situation where Peter is addressing the possibility that women think that their outward looks is going to be what draws the husband to Christ, Peter is one who's going to say, that ain't going to cut it. What really is what, 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 where it's really at is on the inside and the, uh, the, hidden, uh, the, hidden person, um, the hidden person of the heart. Now, notice what it says here. 
And again, let me go back to the beginning of verse four. He says, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a, of a gentle and quiet spirit. Now listen, end of the verse here, which in God's sight is very precious. And see, that really is what we should be concentrating on. I mean, just as far as who are we trying to please here? Who are we trying to please? We're trying to please God. And what God sees and what God looks at and what God considers as, as a value and precious is, is, that, that, is, that, is that hidden person of the human heart as well as the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. God finds that precious and therefore that fact alone should be the motivation of the wife in the home to be able to put their conf- concentration and emphasis on that. Okay. And as they do that and they make God the priority in all this, and the woman says that I'm, I want to do this and I want to, I want to work on the inside because it's important to God. And in God's sight, it's precious there. I think you see that as God comes in and honors that, and as God starts to do the, the changing work in a person's heart, in the woman's heart, just like he does in any believer's heart, whether they're, whether you're a man, woman, married or unmarried, Again, that's the whole thing of sanctification. There you see that there's that there's there there continues to be that 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 change in the in the hidden person of the heart. So when we're talking about the adorning of the inward person, the hidden person of the heart, which you know, which could be a phrase that I guess you could say that that encompasses, you know, a person's thoughts, emotions, you know, that sort of thing, their character, who they are. As that, as that, as that's being, as that's being worked on, as as that motivation of wanting to please God goes on, and as God intervenes and works in their lives and brings sanctification, and God continues to work on them so that they can look more and more like Christ. Listen, as they look more and more like Christ, they the you no know, the husband in the home is getting the real deal on who God is and what God is like. Because what's happening is, is that, that they're seeing God at work in and through that woman, right? That's what we're dealing with here. So the motivation, let, let, let it, let our, let our thoughts and our focus start with, with the motivation of when we, when we work on the inside, the adorning part of this, the adorning part of this is drawing closer to God. And as we draw closer to God, because we want to be closer to him and we want him to change us. As we, as we walk with God in that relationship, he starts to change us. And the, and, and that's, that, that which, that's what you would say the equivalent is of the woman working on the adorning of her inside, the hidden person of the heart. And that's where the emphasis should be. So you see the difference there. You see, see what, what, what we're, what we're trying to get at there. That's what's happening in verse four. Okay. Now you have all, you have this instruction going on. The comparison between the the outward and the inward. And now Peter is going to use history and history of women in the past, godly women in the past, as an example, as, you know, as if to say that this is something that even women of old did. So when you, when you look at verse five, he says, for this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. Okay. Now in verse six, he's going to go on to talk about Sarah. We'll get to her in a second. But again, this is where, this is where Peter draws from. He draws from the women of old. And, and, and in fact, I think there might be some translations that said that, that talks about this, the women of old. I think some, some translations lay that out. I think I'd have to, I'd have to go back and look. I, I'm not a hundred percent sure for, of that, but that's, that's really what Peter is drawing from there. Okay. And that's what he's talking about. And so listen, you know, if we're, if we're wanting to talk about following biblical examples, Peter is saying, look, you had people, women in the Bible back in the olden days who operated in this way and submitted to their husbands and had that be the beauty that, that, that you're after the true beauty of the inward person on the inside that showed itself off in the outward by submitting to, by submitting to their husbands. Okay. Now I want you to notice something, a very interesting phrase here in verse five. So this is how the holy women who hoped in God, 
used to adorn themselves. Now, again, this, this, this points back again to the priority issue. The main priority isn't to do things for the husband. The main, the, the main priority is, is God. God is still the priority. God is still at that top level. The reason why you're doing this is you're doing this for God. And you're putting your hope in him because he's the only person you can put your hope in. You can't put your hope in yourself in thinking that if I adorn myself on the outward, maybe I can do these sorts of things to draw my husband in to salvation. That's putting hope into the external of, of your clothing that you wear. You can't put your hope in, you know, whatever, whatever other kind of tactics that you try. It's not going to work that way. But what this says here in verse five, it says, these are women who put their hope in God. Which is, very, which is a very significant thing to say to a woman who is in an unequally yoked relationship. Because now things are a little bit off. And depending on who you're dealing with, there might have been tensions that have grown out of this whole thing. We talked about how that might emerge last time. We talked about how, that, how those tensions might emerge in a situation like this. We're talking about women of old who put their hope in in God. And Peter is saying this is how this is how they conducted themselves. Women who put their hope in hope in God were women who who acted like this. This is how they as as the verse says used to adorn themselves. Now listen, this is very interesting. It says this is uh for this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. Isn't it interesting how those how those two phrases are juxtaposed next to each other? You know, before we were talking about about adorning the inward person, you let your adorning, um, as it says there, uh, let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty and gent and uh, a beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. He's saying that's what your adorning should be. Now in verse five, he's saying that the holy women in the in the past who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. So the submission aspect, the subjecting, the, the woman subjecting her, uh, herself to the husband and to his authority is also part of that adorning, which leads me to believe that what we're dealing with here is that as the woman adorns herself on the inside by submitting herself to God, putting her hope in God, seeking the Lord, allowing him, uh, allowing him to do the work of change and sanctification as he does in every Christian. What naturally results and what comes as part of that as a natural overflow of that work of God in the inner person of that woman comes subject, uh, submission to her husband. And that is attached to the beauty that is displayed towards the husband who is unbelieving. You see what I'm saying there? So what we're dealing with here is an in is an inward reality that is, is as as that's growing that expresses itself outwardly in the submission of the woman in the home. And I would even and I would even say that works that works in any marriage relationship, whether you're talking about an equally yoked or unequally yoked relate marriage relationship. But most definitely in this situation, and Peter is laying it out here because again, the name of the game is conducting yourself in a way so that the husband can be one without a word to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're dealing with. So if that's what we're talking about here, if that's what Peter is talking about here, what we have to understand, ladies, is that your, your clinging to God is super important in this, in this area. Now, that's not earth shattering. I'm not saying anything that's that's surprising or earth shattering here. But again, if you're putting your if you put yourself in the sandals of a, of a woman who has become a Christian and she's now in an unequally yoked relationship. You know, that situation alone, depending on how the husband reacts, what that does to the dynamics of the of the home and, and everything like that, everything that unfolds from that point, it becomes definitely clear at that point. That if there's anybody, anybody to put your hope, put your hope in, it's to put your hope in God at that point and to continue on to do what you know is right as far as it relates to your own spiritual well-being, because from that spiritual well-being comes the outward conduct that is supposed to happen, that is going to be attractive to the husband, which will include 
submission to the husband. Even though he's not a believer, even though he doesn't, he, he's not operating from that level of truth that you're operating from. As God works in your life and God works in your heart and God works on, on, on transforming that in that inward part of you, which is where the adorn, the concentration of adorning should truly lie. As that happens, you, you see all this, all the beauty that's going on in the inside, all that beauty will, will be expressed outwardly and it'll be a divine work. That's the point. That's the idea. It's going to be a divine work that's going to flourish in that environment, in that situation. Okay. Now, again, let's be truthful about this here. This doesn't, this doesn't mean that in all of those situations as God does those things that the husband automatically is going to be smitten by this, by the, by the continual sanctification and change in his wife and say, I want to come to Christ too. Now, again, obviously it's a possibility. Otherwise Peter wouldn't lay it out as such here. But again, we also know that there are, that there are times when, when the husband says, I don't like this, I want to leave. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7. And again, as it says, in that situation, you are to let him go, right? But what we're dealing with here, the concentration is on, on winning, is winning that unbelieving spouse, that unbelieving husband to Christ. And so he says that this is, you know, the, the whole thing of submitting to your husband's this isn't a new thing. If you want to follow a good biblical example, consider the women of the past, the holy women, as it's as it's re, as it's related as it's related to there, in verse five. For this is how the holy women. So the, you know this whole thing of submission to the to the husband. This isn't this isn't some sort of New Testament innovation that we've never seen before. Peter says this has been around all along. This has been around all along. Now. This is what he says in verse five, but in verse six, he's going to use a specific example of Sarah. So he says, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And we'll get, we'll get to that in a, in a second. I know that that might make people's muscles tense a little bit. And as the rest of that verse says, it says, and you are her children, her being Sarah, and you are her children. Um, if you do if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Okay. So that's, that's the, that's the whole dealio. That's, that's, that's the whole thing there. Now let's go back to the beginning of verse six here. Um, Peter's just got uh, finished saying that the holy women of old in verse five, um, who had hoped in God used to adorn themselves. This is, this is how they adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham. Okay. So now we have two very familiar characters from, from old Testament times who were involved with something like this. Okay. Sarah was one who was submissive to Abraham within the home. Now, was this perfect? No. In the, in the, in the one example that I can, that I can think of in my mind is in Genesis chapter 16, where Sarah you know, tried to forced upon Abraham. Well, I, I don't know if I should say forced upon Abraham because Abraham can, could have said, no, this is not how it's going down. But Sarah says, it's evident. I'm not going to have the Lord. The Lord has prevented me from having children. Maybe I can, maybe I can have children through this Egyptian servant, maidservant, Hagar, because again, God had been making a promise that you're going to have a son and, you know, from him, you know, you're going to have, you're going to, have a people, your, your, your offspring, your descendants are going to be like the stars and uh, stars in the sky, the sand in the se seashore and everything like that. And it's been a while. They've been waiting and still no child. And Sarah was barren and it didn't look like anything was going to change. And so Sarah asserted herself into here and said, here, you take my maidservant Hagar and, and have children through her. And then when Hagar conceived, then Hagar started looking down on Sarah and then Sarah got upset and, you know, it was, it was a whole big mess. You know, I, I don't think that was a particularly bright spot in, in Sarah's life, but that's just one, that's just one spot. And I just mentioned that to say that, you know, we could say that the, that she wasn't perfect just like anybody else wasn't, but, um, but you do, but what you see and what in the, what the testimony of scripture uh, has both in the old testament and even what you're dealing with here with what peter says is that sarah was one who obeyed abraham and what i find very particularly very in interesting about this example of sarah in her submission to abraham 
is that is that Peter is talking to wives who are unequally yoked now with a man who is an unbeliever. But the example that he uses, he draws from two people who, you know, you know, were believers in the, in the sense that we would understand it to be. I mean, I think we understand that Sarah shows up in the faith hall of fame in Hebrews chapter 11, just like it looked just like Abraham does. These two people were people of faith. And so even, even with the example that you have of, of two people who are believers instead of an unequally yoked situation in the, uh, like uh, anything like that, it, what you see here is that the example still applies and the concentration is on the woman. If you want to be like the holy women of old, and particularly for somebody like Sarah, you would do well to follow that example because that's how they beautified themselves. That's what made them look beautiful is is, is them submitting to is is them submitting to their own uh, to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham. Now listen, calling him Lord. Now. That is not, you know, because you know, I know that people will 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 buck and and object and things like that. You mean I have to call my husband Lord and you know everything? No, it's not saying that. That's what a woman must do. That's cultural. That was cultural. Um, I was I was kind of thinking, you know, when I came upon this verse and I was looking at this, I was thinking, well, is there anything in recorded scripture uh, that where where we see Abraham, uh, excuse me, Sarah calling Abraham Lord? And at first I couldn't find some, uh, find anything, but then I saw in a resource where it laid out the one place where it did, where, where she did, and it was in Genesis chapter 18, I believe it's in verse 12. And that wasn't anything that was, that she was direct, uh, that she was saying directly to Abraham, but saying about him to the angelic visitors that came to visit them. And she referred to him in a third person and called him my Lord. Um, so there is at least one anyway, um, of, of an instance where you, where you see that going on. Now that is just descriptive. That's not pre prescriptive. That's not saying, that's not saying that it is re a requirement for women to call their husbands Lord or sir. I mean, that's what basically what that word means in that context. Um, even if it were to relate to me, I wouldn't want a wife, any wife of mine, you know, calling me Lord, that would kind of make me a little bit uncomfortable. And that's not me denying the whole headship and submission roles within the home, but it would just be weird for me if, if, if she called me, if she called me Lord, I have said, eh, can you kindly not do that? That, that, that would be a little bit weird for me. And as well, it would probably be weird for a lot of people, but all this to say that what is, what is, what's being laid out here is not prescriptive. It's descriptive. And it's, and it's describing Sarah's submission to her husband and how she verbally recognized that as such, not just by her actions, but by her, but, but, but by her verbal words, by, by her actually calling Abraham Lord. Okay. And so as that verse uh, concludes and says, and you are her children. In other words, if you imitate her. If you walk along the same lines as she did in submitting to Abraham, then you are following a good example of her and you can be considered her children. Just as you, just as we would say that Abraham was, was our, is our father in the faith, you know, how, how that whole thing is, is written out in Romans chapter four. It's kind of along the same lines of what, of what Peter is saying with the women as, as far as it relates to Sarah and you are her children. If you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Right. So you're, you're along her, you're, you're walking in her footsteps and therefore can be called her children. If, as it says there, if you do good, which again, I think is a natural overflow of what we're talking about here as the adorning of the inside is happening as the adorning of the inward is taking place. Right. And again, that's all a work of God. So if that is happening and you're doing good, you're, you're her children, you're, you're her child. And I, and this, this, this second part here is, is especially interesting here. So it says you and you are her children. If you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Now for a woman who is in an unequally yoked relationship, there could be fear. And I think from a human, human perspective, we might, understand that a, a little bit of ways. Uh, 
because the relationship has changed. And now you're wondering to what extent is it going to change? What is this whole thing going to look like? What if he leads me down a wrong path? I mean, if you're telling me to submit myself to this man who doesn't operate on the, on the level of truth that from where I'm coming from, then there could be some very intimidating and scary things up ahead. If I have to submit, that's frightening. That's, that's fearful. And listen, the way that this, ver- this verse is worded is very interesting. And do not fear anything that is frightening. In that verse, it's not denying that that what's going on is a frightening, intimidating thing. You know, that verse could easily say that verse could easily say, "Do not fear anything at all, because there's nothing to be afraid of." It's interesting that it says, "As long as they as they do good, and do not fear anything that is frightening," which seems to indicate that. From a human perspective, this is a little bit scary. This is this is intimidating, and this is and this is something that 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 says a word about Sarah, because again, if this is if if she, if Peter is saying that you are her children, if you follow in her foot follow in her footsteps, if you continue to do good and do not fear anything that is frightening, that tells us that Sarah was one who didn't walk in fear, either. Okay, and in the same way, if you operate in the same way and you have the same attitude, you are walking in her footsteps and therefore you can be considered her child if you do not fear. Now, what's a reason for not fearing that which is frightening? And again, as it relates to this situation, in in this situation more so than in Sarah's case, because again, with Sarah and Abraham, we're talking about two people of faith. Here, with what with what we're talking about in First Peter chapter three, we're talking about a command for a woman to submit to a husband who is not a believer. Of course, that might be frightening. Of course, we understand that. But how can Peter say, "Don't fe- you, that you do not have to fear anything that is frightening"? Well, if you just go back again. To what Peter says about the about the holy women of the past, remember what it says. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves. If God is in the center of this, He's going to be the guide of everything. He's not going to He's not going to leave you to fend for yourself in this incredibly difficult and sometimes complicated situation. As you put your hope in God, as you cling to him, as you continue to maintain the connectedness of, with God so that he can do a work in and through you, what you see is that there is no need to fear because you know that God is by your side. And not only is God by your side, but not only is God by your side, but God is by your side and he is working. See, if God is working and communing with you and speaking to you. God's not silent. He speaks with you as it relates to all of this. He guides you in wisdom, especially as it relates to how you how you allow yourself to be guided by written by the written word of scripture. As you're doing this, you know, as you're doing all that, you know what you're doing? You're walking by faith. That's what that basic that's basically all that is. And if you're walking by faith, then there's no need to fear that which is frightening. If you read places in scripture and particularly in the gospels, when, when you hear Jesus speaking, you see that there's a clear difference between faith and fear. You know, in a few, in in a few places you hear Jesus telling his disciples, why do you fear? Oh, you of little faith, right? It seems to outline the contrast between those two things. But if you like the women of old, put your hope in God, for your own well-being, for your own spiritual well-being. And as you grow in that relationship with him and you flourish, I think that no matter what happens with the husband, there's going to be no need to fear. Now, of course, we want to see the husband come to know the Lord. And I think you can continue to pray to that end. That's the idea there. The idea there is to continue to put your hope in God, continue to keep him central in all of this, 
and as his work in you is evident it continues to be evident see if he if he continues to work in you and his work in your life continues to be evident even in your life, even to yourself, forget what the husband might see, but even to yourself, as you see the work that God is doing in your life, do you think that that will, that that will lessen fear in your life and will strengthen your faith even more? Yeah, I think so. So as you continue to go in this unequally yoked marriage relationship, you can see yourself in a situation, whereas I don't, I don't fear even though from a human perspective, from a human point of view, I have every I have every reason to be frightened about what path this is going to lead me down as I submit myself to somebody who is not a believer, All right? And the Lord will give you wisdom as you continue to walk in him, okay? So those are Peter's words, okay, to the wife to, sub, 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 uh, to submit the, herself to her own husband everything that entails, why it's important, everything like that. Now, the whole topic of submission, Peter is not done with submission. Now, you might think, well, wait a minute. Peter is now done at the end of verse 6 talking to talking to the women, talking to the wives. How can you say that he's not done talking about submission? Well, if you want to know the answer to that, come back next time because that's what we're going to pick up on on verse 7, okay? And we're going to, and so that's why this, that, that's why I meant, I think I mentioned this last week. You're going to know why I call this, this series of, of episodes where we're talking about this, not, not just simply the submission of the wife in the home, but submission in the home generally in a general sense. And we'll unfold that and we'll talk about that more next time as we, as we start talking about the men, um, in this, in, um, in, in an unequally old marriage relationship. Okay. And what that looks like. Okay, so we will leave it there for now. I hope that brings a little bit more clarity on the submission issue, especially as it relates to women in an unequally yoked marriage relationship. Right. I hope I did a, a, a an adequate and effective job of laying all of that out and what Peter is trying to say in that passage. Okay, we still got some good things to to talk about um, in this section, and again, it's going to it's it's going to uh, involve the men. Christian men. Okay, so we're we're switching from the subject of looking at the of, of the Christian woman and switching to the Christian man and what Peter has to say to that person in verse 7. And so I'd encourage you to tune in at that time. But like I said, we'll leave it there. If you enjoy the show and you haven't done so already, I would encourage you to subscribe to my show on Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, or on YouTube. Um, you can also follow Loving the Scriptures on Twitter. The handle is at LT Scripts, that's L T S E R I P T S, which stands for Loving the Scriptures. See, I don't think this discussion has been all too bad. Um, it's been, you know, it involves things that, you know, from a worldly perspective is, is controversial, but um, I, I, you know, I, I think, I think, uh, the Bible lays out the merits, uh, good merits of, of, of this whole submission thing. And again, as I mentioned just a few seconds ago, submission doesn't necessarily only involve the wife to her husband. All right. It, it does. It does involve different things. Submission might look a little bit different as it relates to uh, wife submitting to the husbands as compared to husbands submitting to the wives. But there is a submission element that goes the other way as well. And we want to talk about that and see that's when it's, when this whole thing of submission is talked about the submission from the other direction is, is what usually gets missed. Okay. And we want to make sure that we cover that and talk about it sufficiently. So that's what we're going to talk about next time. Okay. So, um, glad that you came and, and, and explored uh, scripture with me. I had a great time doing it as I always do. Uh, my name is Steve Gill, and I hope to see you right back here next time. Bye now.